בעזרת השם לעילוי נשמת, לאה בת חפצי, חווה בת דוד, יהודה, נוריאל, נורי, בן בטי. אין להבדיל לרפואת חניתה בת ימנה, שען אז דבורה אלישע בת שרה, חיים מאיר בן יהודית, אין אוסו לעילוי נשמת אברהם בן אפרים, אין מזל בת כסייה. ברוך השם, last week we finished the series, if you remember, three Three lectures. I wanted to do it more, but I saw that people are not interested in a topic, even though they don't know what I talked about. If they would listen to the lecture, they'll see that those whole three lectures were maybe the best I ever gave, those three. But people uh, follow the name, you know. Same thing in movies. They see a name, and they decide if they want to watch it or not. What does the name say about the movie? Nothing. What was the name of the lecture say about the lecture? Nothing. The lecture is spontaneous. It talks about many different things. But this is, I guess, the way it works. So I figure, you know, if the people are not interested, let's not waste too much time on it. But uh, we're going back to uh, the parasha. We read on Shabbat parashat Vayakel. Mitzvah and the Torah every seven years to gather the nation. And uh, it's like a gathering. Everybody comes, the leader speaks, they divide them to groups. Everybody reads in the Torah. They all check their own Torah to make sure they didn't make any mistakes, any errors. This is how they kept the Torah always authentic, accurate. Otherwise, if they wouldn't do it, What happened to the Christians and the Muslims would also happen here. We have one Torah all over the world. Even the, the Jews were scattered everywhere. Everybody chased them. Everyone wanted to kill them. Everyone wanted to burn their Torah in the synagogues. In the end, all of these anti-Semite Nazis are all gone from the world. And the Torah is still here. I can't move an inch without it. It's the book of God. There's nothing more precious to him than the Torah. So the Torah is one Torah everywhere you go. <laughs> you go to, to Yemen, to Poland, to Russia, to Iran, to Lebanon. Any Torah you have, same Torah. Ask the Christian to show you how many versions they have to their New Testament. More than 200,000 different, 200, different texts. Think about it. 200,000 different texts. Everybody copied and copied and copied. Remember, printing is only 500 years old. For 1,500 years, they were copying manually. Every person made one error. That's it. One error from a very large book. A very logical, at least one, sometimes 10, sometimes 50 errors. But here, let's say one. If everybody who copied it made one mistake, here you go. Now you understand why you have 200,000 different texts. However... Same thing Islam. Islam is not as bad because it's not 2,000 years. It's only 1,300 years. So, you know, it's all like a snowball. So, for a period of 800 years, they were copying the Quran manually. That's why you have hundreds of different Quran. Hundreds. Then they started to split to Shiites and Sunnis. They believe in Ali, don't believe in Ali. It became like two different religions. They hate each other very much and kill each other daily. kill each other daily, Shiites, Sunnis, they hate each other almost as much as they hate Jews, almost as much. So those are the Christians and the Muslims. The Jews, one verse in the Torah warned them not to modify the Torah even by one tiny bit, one letter. If you erase one letter from the Torah or you add a letter to the Torah, It's a dead penalty. Dead penalty. <laughs> Can you believe that? Why Hashem was so strict about it? The answer is very, very logical. I'm giving the world the book. Based on this book, I created the world. Everything that happens in the world is depend on the book. And you want to modify the blueprint of the creation? of all the worlds and the upper worlds and the, 
the spiritual world. Do you know what it means to modify one letter from the divine book? Or to miss uh, one word or one sentence or to change names or dates? To mess up with the book of God? Do you know what it is? Even the lousy, reform, wicked people that do not keep one mitzvah from the Torah, not even one commandment they don't keep, nothing, zero, zero whatsoever. Uh, it's literally zero. They don't keep one mitzvah according to the Torah. They marry non-Jews, they marry men with men, they mechalel Shabbat, they eat whatever they want. Not one mitzvah they don't keep. They eat non-kosher. There's nothing Jewish about them. And by the way, biologically, the vast majority of them are not Jewish according to Jewish law. Because the mothers, grandmothers, grand-grandmothers from the mother's side, many of them are not Jewish. You know, it all became a salad. You don't know anymore who's a Jew there, who's not a Jew. That's why we have to look at them. The status is that they're all non-Jews, all of them. When everyone comes and tells you I'm a Reformed Jew, you have to know right away that he's not a Jew. He cannot count him as a Jew. He cannot marry him. He cannot marry his, her children. If it's a woman, she tells you I'm a Reformed Jew. That means you're not allowed to marry her kids. Why? Because the kids are not Jewish. And it doesn't matter what stories they tell you. Oh, my grandmother, grandfather was a rabbi in Poland or in Russia. Whatever they say goes in from one ear, immediately should come out from the other ear. Right away, ignore what they say because they themselves don't know what they are. It's already 11 generations that they are assimilated. 11 generations. You know, can you count on them? This is all the way going back to Moses Mendelssohn, 230 years ago. From then, they already married non-Jews. From that time, after 11 generations, there's no way to prove what they are. Therefore, they all count as non-Jews. So that's one thing. As bad as they are, as much as they rebel against God, one thing they never dare to do. They never actually changed the text of the Torah. It's very interesting. It's much very interesting. It would be a lot easier for them to modify the Torah and make themselves a different Torah. For instance, when the Torah says an allowed relationship between men and men, it's that penalty. They'll change it. They say if a man loves a man, God is giving him a blessing, he should form a family, he should adopt kids, bring them from Brazil. And God is very happy. You know, they can make a different book. After a few generations, there will be two Torahs in the world. The Torah of the Orthodox Jews and the Torah of this lousy reform. But they never did it. It's unbelievable. They have a Torah in their synagogues, if you can call their place a synagogue. You take out the Torah from the Ark, it's, it's exactly the same Torah that we have in any other shul. It's not no different words there. They pay fifty thousand dollars for an Ashkenazi Sefer Torah in Israel. They buy the best one. They pay plenty of money. Many of them are academic. They, you know, they're not cheap when it comes to buy Torah scrolls. Torah is handmade. It's three hundred and four thousand eight hundred and five letters. It's written with a feather. Dip it in the ink. It's a very long job. Just the parchment. It's made from the, from the leather of the cow. They remove the hair, they make it white with the lime. It's a whole process. Then they make lines. Ooh, you know how, what a process it is. Just the parchments, before you begin to write on it, cost thousands of dollars. You know how long it is? It can go all the way from here, to maybe two blocks. That's how long it is. Uh, 54 parshiot. Each parshia have like four, five, six pages, the pen. You know, it's, it's, it's very, very long. It's heavy also. Some Ashkenazi Sifre Torah, you cannot even pick it up. It's, it's, it's 100% the weight of the parchments. Svaradi Torah, they have a box. The silver box, the wood, makes it more heavy. But the Ashkenazim, they have two sticks. The sticks are not so heavy. And you still see that at least, at least the old ones, they used to make them very heavy. And tall, it's very hard to lift it. Today they make it smaller. The generation is weak. 
people don't have the strength to lift out the Torah, especially if it's on one side. In the beginning of the Torah, everything is on one side. You need a very strong hand. Your hand begins to shake. Chaz v'shalom, if the Torah falls on the floor, everybody has to fast. Give tzedakah, it's a big thing. It's a disaster if the Torah falls on the floor. If the, the book of God fell on the floor, shh, it's a day of mourning. The whole community mourned. It's a very bad sign. The person that knocked it on the floor oh, probably would not sleep for a month. You have a different book, falls on the floor. Pick it up, you kiss it, see, do whatever. But the actual Torah, handmade, you know. So it's very expensive, it's very difficult to make. And they buy, they buy five, ten, twenty, whatever they need, depending on how big is their place. Even though almost nobody goes there all year round, they pray with the Zoom, if they pray. I don't know who they pray to. Two, three people on the Zoom, supposedly they pray. And they meet on Yom Kippur, maybe on holidays, that's it. They have a woman getting on with her mini skirt and her high heels. She's not Jewish, she's from Korea. She has a yamaka on her head, white yamaka with curls. And she reads, Vayom er Hashem el Moshe. She's not Jewish. She went to somewhere, they, they taught her how to read. Then on Friday night, they bring a band, jazz. They play jazz in a synagogue, cello, violin, drums, trumpet, you know. This is the Kabbalat Shabbat. They sing. It's like, it's like in a bar in Manhattan. It looks like a circus. Nothing is holy in their lifestyle. Not even one moment is holy. But one thing they never did, they never actually modified the Torah. Not because they were afraid of the death penalty. Because there are many other sins in the Torah that have death penalty, such as gay activity, breaking Shabbat, you know, avodah zarah, idol worshiping. There's a lot of other things that is death penalty. They don't, care, they don't care about the other death penalty. Why should they care about here? It's just that from Shamaim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made sure that the Torah will never be modified. Now we will never lose the Mesorah, the tradition of the Torah, the way it was given to us in Mount Sinai. Imagine today you will have different versions of Torah. That will be the end of the, the religion. Because by them, the religion is like tradition. It doesn't matter mistakes in a book. It doesn't dis, does not disqualify the book. If you come to Muhammad, you say to him, look, in this Quran it's written this way, and in this Quran it's written different. How are you going to follow? One of them for sure it's fake. You don't know which one is the original and which one is fake. Maybe both of them are fake. Both of them are after someone accidentally modified the book and made mistakes. How do you follow a book that is not 100% accurate according to your prophet? Not that he was a prophet, but they believe he was. Okay, according to your belief, the prophet gave you a book from God. And now you have hundreds of different books. How do you know which one of them is the book of God? There's no way to know. You cannot prove which one was the original, because if you could, you would fix all the other books according to the original text. So how can you worship a book that is different than the original? Most likely it's not the book that Muhammad actually gave. The answer is no big deal. It's 90% accurate. They don't care. They don't understand the concept of a holy book, divine book, if you change one word over there, that's it. You know, when, you, when we buy a Sefer Torah, we bring it from Israel to the United States. If they would write it here, the price probably would be $100,000 based on labor here. Same thing, Tfilin, Mezuzot, everything would cost three times more. We're lucky that uh, the Tfilin, the Mezuzot that we have over here are written by Israeli Talmidei Chachamim and Sofrim. They write over there according to Israel's uh, hourly, you know, salary, which is not a lot. It's 35, 40 shekel, it's $10, 10, 11 dollars an hour. Do you know one sofer here will agree to work for 11 dollars? In your dreams. You cannot start with less than 30 dollars an hour. Right there, you already know how much it's going to cost you. 
to make one pair of tefillin, it takes a year. From the minute they slaughter the cow and remove the skin, until that skin we can, we will become those two black boxes, it's a process of one year. And then the sofer takes him days to write, they put it in. It's a whole process. It's very, very long and not an easy job. And it's, it's, the price is ridiculous. Ridiculous. You know, I'll give you an example. If you buy a Persian rug, Persian rug, they need with the hands. Let's say it took them a year to do. They sit, little kids with little fingers, they sit, and they do it manually. One year it takes them to do a rug. The material is very cheap. Either wool or linen. Wool and linen cost nothing. How much the material of the rug costs? Not even 20, 30, 50 dollars the most. But the rug would cost you 30,000, 40,000 dollars. Original handmade. Chinese even more now. Chinese market. White filling doesn't cost 30, 40,000. It's also a very long job. <laughs> Whole process and many, many people participate in making it. The answer is because Hashem didn't want it to be 30,000. Imagine if it would be $30,000 a pair. Each family, best case scenario, will have one pair. They will have to split the kids. You come to shul, one kid puts it on, then he gives it to the other. So it will be very, very difficult. And what about mezuzot? You need to put mezuzot, you know. Especially here in America, when the, some houses are so big, size of hotels, you need sometimes 40, 50 mezuzot, even more. I once told you the story that I went to Riverdale to put mezuzot for a family that just built a house there. I went with an assistant in the morning. All day until the evening, we were putting mezuzot there. Close to 100 mezuzot we had to put there. Pshh. It just not, did not end. How many doors and how many rooms. And it didn't end. So imagine now if a mezuzah would be $1,000 one, each one. You need uh, or close to 100 mezuzot. $100,000 just the mezuzot. So Baruch Hashem, it's, uh, also Ezra Sofer, you know, it's also from Hashem, of course, made sure that the suffering will never be rich. Will never be rich. Why? Because if they'll be rich, they would not want to write. If they won't want to write, the merchandise in the market will be very limited. And the prices will go higher and higher every day because there's not that much, right? Everybody needs to buy one. So 500 people bid on one mezuzah or on one fill-in. Obviously, the price will go to thousands of dollars. So what did he do? He made sure that anyone that is a sofer will never become rich. No matter how much he writes. Why? <laughs> because you want the market to be flooded with merchandise. That they keep the price low. It's not so low. Here in America, if you want to buy a good mezuzah, I charge you over $300 for one good mezuzah. Mamash good one. I get it for a third of the price. But in general... This is the prices here. Remember, they have stores, they have to pay rent, employees, insurance, electric, advertisement, you know, a lot of expenses in the business. So, it's, you know, it's not only what he pays for the mezuzah, it's what he pays for the store. That alone costs more money than the actual merchandise. So, you know, it's a, it's a process. It takes three hours, four hours, depending how slow he writes. To write it, just the cloth alone, it's fifteen twenty dollars. The parchment. Remember, it's a leather. It's processed leather. They remove the skin, the 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 hair. It's a whole process. It's not a piece of paper. Then you have the person who makes the crowns. You pay him a few dollars. The person that that check it with the computer scan. You have to pay him a few dollars. Then you have to pay someone to check the mezuzah manually. You have to pay him a few dollars. Before he even started, between 30 and 40 dollars it cost him just to create the mezuzah. Then another three, four hours of work. It's a long process. Imagine it would be here in America. Who would agree to work for, for 15 dollars an hour? 
professional sofer that is being tested every year, he goes, they exam him to make sure he didn't forget the halachot. There are hundreds of hundreds of halachot. One halacha you forgot, you, didn't, you made a mistake. It can be all your mezuzot from now on on our kosher. Mezuzot and tefillin is life and death. No joke, life and death. You know, life and death. How many tragedies happen and in the end they found mistakes in mezuzot. Someone had a heart attack and then another one, they check his mezuzah in his room, the word levavchem was erased. Your heart was erased. Two heart attacks. Someone lost a child. So bring the mezuzot. The word your child in the mezuzah, benechem, was erased. The actual reality, the, the reality of the mezuzah actually create the physical reality in life. I told you once the story about my son. Today is 21. When he was uh, three years old, he still did not talk a word. We started to get very worried. I said, wow, well, how can it be? We had to take him to a specialist in Westchester. Someone who played with him with Lego. He changes the cogn- cognitivity of the brain. The brain function, if he knows to put things in a roll. Say to me, the test is fine. His brain function, everything is fine. <laughs> he didn't know what to say, the guy. Then after that, one day my wife comes to me and says, yeah, I want you to check the, the mezuzah in his room. I say, Ma, Ma, Pito, you don't have to check. I get the best mezuzot. Nothing to check. It was checked, computer check. How many checks? Trust me, I had a dream. There's a problem with his mezuzah. I say, you know what? What do I have to lose? Let me go check it. I open the screw in the bottom, try to pull it out. See, it's empty inside. No mezuzah, just a plastic box. Empty. So, wow, how did it happen? We put an empty box without the actual mezuzah inside. What happened? When we did Hanukkah Tabayit, we invited the whole yeshiva, all the bachurim, everyone came. I say, instead of wasting two hours now, going, me, myself, going from one door to another, stick the mezuzot, I have a great idea. We'll put them all in the boxes. Each bachur yeshiva will have a door. I make the bracha on the main door. Everyone listens. They say, amen. Everyone, without talking, they go to the room, which I told them in advance, you in this room, you here, you here, you the garage, you the basement. Everyone knows where he stick his mezuzah. And we did it. Everybody put his mezuzah. In five minutes, we finished. There's only one problem. One of them, maybe wasn't thinking, did not put the mezuzah inside the box. He put an empty mezuzah in his room. Immediately, I took mezuzah, I put it in. The next morning, a month later, the next morning the Rebbe called. He said, I don't understand what happened with your son. All of a sudden he started to speak today fluently. Yesterday I couldn't say a word. He said, what happened? (laughs) What happened? For three years he didn't have mezuzah in his room. You see that the mezuzah effect not just the quality of your life, affect your life if you live or not, if you be sick or not. Chas v'shalom tragedies can happen. <sighs> Amazing. If one, le- one letter touch another letter, actually two letters become one. The computer that scans it, instead of 713 letters that you have in a mezuzah, it shows that you have 712 letters. And he shows you where, where one letter touched the other, or one word touched another word. Sometimes it's a word from the top row, the kuf goes all the way down and touched the top of a letter from the, from the line below. Sometimes the lamet go up, the lamet can touch the letter from the row ab- above. So two words actually become one. Two letters become one. It mess up the meaning of the entire mezuzah. I give you another example. 
sometimes you make the yud a little bit too long. It looks like a vav. What are you going to do now? You have to bring a little child and ask him, what letter is this? If he say yud, kosher. If he say vav, not kosher. Obviously, you see, there's a problem. Sometimes, by mistake, you want to you wanna write a vav, you make it short. It looks like a yud. It changed the meaning of the word. Sometimes resh, you didn't make the top long enough. It looks like a vav. Sometimes resh, by mistake, you make a little bit ink, goes on the top to the right, it looks like a dalet. For instance, sometimes you make the dalet looks like a resh, because you didn't have on the right side a little bit goes to the side, so it looks like a resh. So the Gemara say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Our God is one, Echad. If the Dalet, God forbid, became resh, you say, Hashem Elokeinu, our God is a different God. It changed the meaning of the word. Instead of one, it changed it to different. Do you know what a curse it is? It messed up your life, such thing. I'm not even talking about the Christian missionary crooks that they are masters of lying and deceiving. They come to innocent Jews. Come, we'll give you mezuzot for free. People want to save money and then they lose their life. And they come to them and say, come here, we have mezuzah for you. And they bring, usually they bring red mezuzot. Why their mezuzot is red? The blood of J.C. Penny. This is the blood of J.C. Everything by them is their idol, J.C., J.C. You know, so what happens? Some naive secular Jews, ah, I got mezuzot for free. Now the Christians, they don't come with a cross or looks like a priest. He pretends to be a Jew. He comes with tzitzit, with a beard, big yamaka. And the guy, he doesn't know left and right, this secular guy. He gets mezuzot for free and he puts it in and inside you have crosses and the name of Yoshke. One day you open it up. Usually it's not even a cloth. It's not parchments. It's a piece of paper. And then people wonder why their life look like a mess. With all of that being said, remember, before we check the mezuzot and the tefillin and hope that the problem is there, we have to first check ourselves. People sometimes count, ah, I hope my tefillin is not kosher. Why? I keep falling and breaking bones. I hope that the problem is the tefillin. Of course he hopes the problem is the tefillin. I'll pay two more thousand dollars and get a new pair. Much easier than to start changing his entire lifestyle. Oh, my boy has problems. We hope the mezuzah is not kosher. Why, are you fool? You have to buy a new mezuzah now. What's better? That we're going to have to start keeping Shabbat? <laughs> That's an easy way out. The sofer would say, the mezuzah in your son was not kosher. That's why he's sick. Ah, problem is solved. Get, get us the best mezuzah. How much? Kach, 300. Here, take five, Rabbi. Keep. Ah, we're so happy. Why? <laughs> Thinking now the boy is going to start running. That's it. No more sicknesses. He doesn't want to check himself, his wife, this, that, Arat Mishpacha, Shmirat Shabbat, modesty. Much easier to pay a few hundred and finish the problem. So anyway, Rabotai, Hashem knew that when people copy, one copy from another, they will make human errors. The only way to avoid human errors was to give a huge punishment if you, make, if you make a mistake by writing the Torah, not correctly. What do you mean? I'm not an angel. I'm a human being. People make mistakes. You can skip a word. Sometimes they take a very high level feeling to check before they sell it. First time. And a word is missing. A whole word. You skip the word. It happens. This is people. People are people. So, so that's why the Torah say you have to check and check and check and check. And the more you check, the better it is. Then you give it to Magia, professional one. But you know, in Israel, you're going to be very careful. Why? 
because the Israeli mentality, the mentality of the nation, because of the life there with the murderers, the Arabs, the Nazis that lives inside you and around you, and the traffic, and the financial crisis, and now the war, and so much stress, and high taxes, and hot and humid weather. There's so many things that people have to challenge right now with that they don't have the head for anything anymore. So you have to be very careful. You give it to someone to check the mezuzot. The mentality of most people is hafif. How do you say hafif in English? Let's get it over with, quickly. Hafif. You know how the cleaning lady push the dirt under the rug or under the couch? She doesn't want to start now bending down, cleaning with the map under the couch. She push everything in. Usually when you're going to find the treasure, she leaves you before Pesach. When you move the couches or the refrigerator. Wow. When we move the refrigerator, when we clean for Pesach, psh, elephants are riding there. You know, you know how much stuff she push underneath? You can barely pull out the fridge. Why? There's so much dirt that she push under the, from the holes there. Instead of bending down and picking it up, once a year you find the treasure she leaves you. You know? So that's called hafif. Yalla, let's get it over with. You gotta be very careful. I'm talking to you from experience. Not everyone you can rely on to check. Some people, you pay the money. You pay the money. 10, 15 sh- shekel, you pay for each mezuzah they check. Four, five dollars. And then after that, you have missing crowns. When you send it to the computer check, the computer say, 11 crowns are missing. You go, you go back to the guy say, I don't get it. What, you blind? You check the mezuzah. How did you miss 11 crowns are missing? Even though if the crowns are missing, it doesn't make the mezuzah not kosher, still kosher, but it's not in the highest level as it was if it was with crowns. The crowns, they go on certain ladders. Which ladders? Sha'atnez gets. Sha'atnez, in the Torah, it's when you mix wool and linen together, it brings problems. Why? Because the first murder in a creation between Cain and Evel was because of wool and linen. Cain, he was a farmer. He was growing linen. It's like cotton. And Evel was a shepherd. He was in charge of the sheep, the sons of Adam. Then God said to them, I want you to bring a nice sacrifice to honor your God. Evel got the best wool, clean it, washed it, cut the best wool from the sheep. And Cain just picked up any linen he saw, quickly, hafif. Cain was Israeli, I guess. Picked up, yalla, yalla, let's bring something. Let's not waste too much time on it. Yalla, yalla, rush. So what happened? Hashem took the sacrifice from the one who put his efforts, Evel. He got very jealous and murdered him. You can give him a benefit of the doubt that he didn't know what it means to murder because he never saw anybody get killed. We know how you kill a person. You hit him on the head a few times, he's going to die. But Cain didn't know what would happen if he took a rock and hit him on the head and saw him bleeding. He didn't understand what it means to die that he, he will die in two minutes. Then he probably was trying to wake him up. Wake up, brother. What are you sleeping now? That's it. He's not waking up. He realized what he, what he have done. So Hashem said, because of wool and linen, the first murder already happened in the creation, they can never get mixed together. That's why when we buy all clothes that we buy, Jews, they have to, they have an obligation to check if you buy 100% wool or even 50% wool or any kind of wool you have in a, in a garment, you have to take it to a lab, special sharpness lab to check, make sure there's no linen sewed with the wool together. Usually in expensive Italian suit that comes from Italy, not those who are made in China, usually, in the color they saw inside there's a net. The net, they saw 
the, 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 the strings gets together with that net and it's wool and linen mixed together. So if they find it in the lab, what do they do? They, make, they cut with the razor, they cut half an inch hole, he puts his finger inside, they are such expert, by touching it they know if it's, it's linen or not. They already know. And they have this big magnified glass, huge one with the light. When you put it under the magnified glass, a string of a wool and a string of a linen looks completely different. It looks uh, probably a thousand times bigger in a, in a magnified glass. It looks like bamboos. You know how the bamboos look? The bamboos have lines. So the lines of the wool and the lines of the linen are completely different. That's how they know if this string is wool or linen, because sometimes it's hard to know. So they check. If it is, they remove the net, put a different one, re the color, fix it. Sometimes the buttons, the buttons are so with linen. Why? Linen is much stronger than wool. So they don't want the buttons to come out. They sew at the Italians with linen strings into the wool. The jacket is wool, and the strings of the linen that get mixed with the wool, it's linen. The Italians don't know about wool and linen. They want to make a good quality. And here you go. You're wearing something that has sharpness on it. It can happen in hats. Some hats, you know, inside it's full with, with linen and wool mixed. Bottom line, you got to check. People that wear shatnez, their prayers are blocked for 40 days. Praying, crying to Hashem. It's blocked. It's like a lid. Closed on top of you. Nothing goes up to Shemaim. We got to be very careful. We have to be careful. That's why everything that has... Today, Baruch Hashem, they make very nice suits that are made 100% from polyester. Looks just as good as wool. Nobody will tell the difference. My mash look fancy. Like super 120 wool. And then you see inside, 100% polyester. In the old days, polyester used to look like plastic, like garbage. Today, with the technology, they made it so good that sometimes it looks even better than wool. It can be fancy suit, and it's made 100% from polyester. Then you don't have any problem. You don't have to check. It's 100% polyester, no problem. So when they say 100% wool, doesn't mean it doesn't have linen. They don't count the net here. They don't count the strings of the buttons. They actually talk about the actual suit. Sometimes the garment is mixed with wool and linen. There's nothing you can do about it. Everything is sewed together from top to the bottom, wool and linen. The strings are mixed. There's nothing you can do. A Jew can never wear this uh, suit. So that's just to give you an idea. So this chatnez, if you look at the letters, it's Satan as strong Satan. It brings much like the devil on you. People that have mezuzot in the house, the mezuzot needs to have crowns on those letters of Satan as. Sha'atnez, gets. Why? It minimizes the power of the sitracha, of the, of the negative powers in a creation. Needless to say, if the mezuzah is not kosher in your house, that all kinds of demons are walking free into your house. I just had a guy yesterday... He wanted to come tonight. I told him I'm not going to have time to do it. But uh, he said to me that uh, in the middle of the night, his wife felt someone is touching her legs. Middle of the night. I don't know, 1 a.m., something like that. She thought it's him. Then she saw that he's asleep, totally asleep. She looks and she saw like a black cloud. And uh, she got very, very scared and she was frozen. She couldn't talk, she couldn't move. You want to say something, you want to scream, it's like you choked, you cannot talk. In the end, she somehow made uh, some kind of a scream, and that cloud ran away. Now he's asking me what it is. <laughs> do you understand? So I told him, first thing you do, you check your mezuzot. Right away, check the mezuzot. 
If there are good kosher mezuzot, they are afraid to enter the house. The kedusha, the holiness, makes the impurity run away. If there's no holiness, the impurity comes to suck and receive their food. Give you an example. If a person is doing now a good deed for the sake of heaven, why do you do it, Moshe? God said so. I'm doing it for Hashem. Hashem told me to do it. I do it with happiness. Not for show off. Not for pride. Not for ego. Not to impress anyone. Not for money. Not for good shiduch. 100% between me and Hashem. This mitzvah is very holy. Very pure. The Satan has no permission to suck from this mitzvah. Doesn't, it doesn't have permission. If the mitzvah is done for political reasons, for show off, to pretend that you are such a tzaddik, to impress someone, to impress a girl that you want her for shiduch, or to impress a guy to think that you're somebody special, or for money, for money, he only comes if he gets paid. Come, teach Torah. There's a miserable people here. They don't know anything. You can come once a week, teach them, help them to learn, Aleph Bet at least. No, I want over a thousand dollars a lecture. Ah, come on, there's teenagers here. Only for the money he comes. If, if there's no money, he refuses to come. To begin with, all his mitzvot goes to the Sitrachra. The Satan has permission to suck from it. That's why we have a good minhag, according to Kabbalah, before we pray and before we do certain mitzvot, we say L'Shem Yichud. L'Shem Yichud Kudsha Berichu, Ushchinte, Bitchilu, Urchimu, Urchimu Dachilu, Leachada, Shem Yudke, Bevavke, Bechuda Shalim, Shem Kol Yisrael. Ine anachnu ba'im l'itpalel tfilat arvit. Shtiken Yaakov Avinu, עליו השלום, עם כל המצוות, הכלולות בה, לתקן את שורשם במקום עליון, ואז we finish, ויהי נועם אדוני אלוהינו עלינו, ומעשה ידינו כוננה עלינו, ומעשה ידינו כוננהו. We say it two times. This supposed to eliminate the ability of the sitra achra to suck and take some of your mitzvot. To eliminate it. It's like, it's like uh, the antidote, you know, against the virus. Problem today, that people, when they say it, they don't have in mind anything. Their mind is somewhere else. Anybody pay attention when they say L'Shem Yichud? The idea is what to say L'Shem Yichud, you have to have in mind, I'm about to do this mitzvah for, for the sake of God and the, and the pleasance of Hashem will be on me. People are today, their mind is uh, destroyed. Do you know, in the old days, if someone prayed Shmona Yisrei, and he started Hashem Sfatai Tiftach, until Baruch Atah Hashem Ha'el HaKadosh, he has to focus on every word. If he did not focus, he has to start from the beginning. But today we don't start from the beginning. You remember now, Baruch Atah Hashem again Avraham, you didn't think about any word. You think about the noise, you think about the air condition in the shul, this annoying guy in front of you, everyone has something in his mind when he prays. So one person thinks about his office, he has a critical meeting today, whatever the case is. So now you're thinking, wow, I just say, Baruch Atah Hashem again Avraham, I did not think about any word. Let me start again, Hashem Sfatai Tiftah. You shouldn't, why? Because most likely you won't be able to focus again. So what are you going to do? hundred times when you OCD? Again and again and again. Why? Because it's very hard to focus. That's how corrupted the minds are. In the old days, usually 90 out of a hundred times, a person would be able to focus on every word. Until Ayla Kadosh, you must focus. But today people are so... So lost in their mind, especially when everything is electronic and your mind barely thinks. People that don't sit and learn Torah full day, their mind is very rusty. Unless they are great mathematicians that all day they make their brain work very hard. 
brain is like a muscle. If the muscle works every day, it becomes good, healthy, strong, you know, looks good, has ability, strength. But if a person doesn't practice, all his muscles are like water. No, very mushy. Don't have strength, don't look good. Has all kinds of pain. Same thing the brain. If the brain is not used to think daily and in a very high level, after a few years, the moach, the brain mitnaven. What does it mean mitnaven? Like a muscle who became unable. Cannot focus, cannot concentrate, cannot remember, cannot understand the order. Somebody asked him three questions. By the time he get to the third question, he already forgot the first and the second. Repeat, please. Or he is listening to the speaker. The speaker asks a question from the audience. There's always half of the people. Excuse me, Rabbi, can you repeat the question? So, okay, you repeat the question. There are still some people who didn't focus. Second time. Why is it? Difficult. They have difficulty to focus. I'll give you an example. You want to know if your brain functions or not? Think about one, uh, one expression for one minute, straight. One minute without having any interference in your mind. Can you sit 60 seconds? 60 seconds and think about something. Let's say you want to think about the word mezuzah. Mezuzah, how it looks. Beautiful riding, this, my Israel. Okay, let me think about mezuzah, 60 seconds. What happened after five seconds? Your child, your husband, this, that. Mm, hundreds of things comes into your mind. That's why people today, they live with the feeling that we cannot control our mind. We can't control our mind. But that's a very big mistake, because according to the Torah, there are some punishments for thinking about the wrong things. If you couldn't control your mind, why there would be a punishment for something that's not in my hand? There's no punishment for being unable to fly. I cannot fly. There's no punishment in the Torah, because you cannot fly, I'm punishing you. There's no punishment for not having blue eyes. Or not having brown eyes. Why? It's not in my hand. There's no punishment for having blonde hair or black hair. Why? It's not in my hand. There are reward and punishment. Benji, put the heat on, please. People are freezing here. So, there is no... There's no punishment of something that is not in your hand. There is only a punishment in things that is 100% subject to your choices and your actions. That's why there is reward and punishment for being righteous or wicked, or doing a good deed or a bad deed. But there is no punishment of being short or tall. Things that are in your hand, you are subject to consequences, for good or for bad. So if the Torah say, if someone think about idol worshipping, just think, it's already a punishment for that. It's already a sin from the Torah. A person think about a not modest woman, fantasizing. That's already a isur d'oraita, worse than eating pork. If he cannot control his mind, what, what the Torah wants from him, poor guy. All kinds of thoughts come through his mind. He doesn't control it. He's not happy from it, that this attacking him. The answer is, the reason why there are punishments for certain thoughts, or reward, by the way. If you think about God, I love you. You walk in the street, and you think, Hashem, there's no words for me to tell you how much I love you, how much I appreciate you, how much you're the only one, how much I don't believe in anything but you. Everything I have is you. Thank you for everything. Even when I suffer, even when I miss the bus, every second of his life, thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you. It's so good. So great. I appreciate it. I wonder why I lost the bus. I don't know, but I'm sure it's good. I wonder why I missed my flight. 
I wonder why I'm stuck in traffic for two hours at 2 a.m. I wonder. I mean, I'm curious to know. But, I'm, but no complaint. To wonder why it's happening to me, there's no problem. You have to. Because Hashem wants you to investigate what you did wrong, that you are being punished right now. It has to be measure for measure. Samson, a prophet from the tribe of Dan, the Philistine took a knife, heated it up, and poked both of his eyes and made him blind. Why someone that is a messenger of God is a Nazir, special holy monk from birth, couldn't cut his hair, you know, it's, it's a, Hashem sent an angel to his mother and father to inform them that they're going to have a holy son and he's going to be born already holy. Meaning the mother already cannot drink wine, don't eat grapes, no raisins. Why? She's like Nezirut, Nezira. So the angel are telling her, her name was Tzlalfonit. Tzlalfonit, that's the mother of Shimshon. And his father, his name was Manoach. And the father wasn't a Talmid Chacham, wasn't some kind of a rabbi. The Gemara say he was Am Haaretz. He was an ignorant Jew, Manoach. So ordinary people, angel comes, the, ma the mother was a barren, she cannot have kids. The angel come and say to her, you're going to be pregnant now, you have to start preparing. This boy will be someone who will save the Jewish nation from the Philistines. Not Palestinians. Palestinians are crooks. They took the name that the Romans gave the Holy Land. They called it Palestina after Philistines, which is a whole different nation. They're not Arabs, nothing to do with Ishmael. And they adopted the name to claim a false claim that they own the land. Everybody knows it's a scam. Everyone knows they're lying. Everyone knows the Jews were always there. Every Christian and Muslims read in the Tanakh that King David was there and the Jews were there 2,000 years before there were any Arab nation. Bichlal. Forget about Palestinians. Palestinians, it's from 1964. Before that, there's no such thing, Palestinian nation. Bunch of Arabs. All of a sudden, they decided to make themselves a flag and a, and a government and a PLO. It was a terror organization run by Yasser Arafat in Machshimo. And that's who they were. They, went, they never had a nation. They never had a representative in the United Nations. They never had an anthem. They never had an army. They never had anything. They don't have one history book from before 1964. I mean, the Jews have tens of thousands of history books about their glorious history and uh, achievements. They don't have one book. There is a joke. One minister in the Knesset, she came and she said, I brought you a very special book today. This is the book of the history of the Palestinian people. Let's learn it together. She opened it up, all blank pages. First page, blank, blank, blank. Why? There's no such nation. It's all a scam. It's a bunch of Arabs from different countries, from Egypt, from Jordan. Most of them Jordanians. Jordan is, <laughs> is Palestinians. Iraqi, this, that, from different countries. All of a sudden, they decided to make themselves a nation. And how they named themselves? Palestine. But the interesting part is that in the Arabic alphabet, you don't have the letter P. They can say P. They say instead of P, they say B. If an Arab wants to buy pizza, he comes to the Italian Joey in a pizza shop. Hi, Joey, how are you? Give me two pizza, please. Excuse me? Give me two pizza. What's pizza? This, this. Say pizza. Can't. They want to say uh, pachit cola. Pachit means a can of coke. They say pachit. Pachit cola. They can't say pachit. How will they name themselves in a name that they cannot even pronounce? Did you ever see such a joke? Imagine now you have uh, the nation of Czech Czechoslovakia. Czech. The Czech Republic. And they cannot say the letter Che. They can't. No Czech citizen can pronounce the letter Czech. They say Czech. All kinds of words. But they cannot say, how is your name Czechoslovakia, Czech, when you cannot pronounce it? Something doesn't add up here. 
Imagine United States. The Americans cannot say you. Let's say. They cannot say the letter you. How are they going to pronounce United States? They're going to say, ooh, United States. They won't be able to say you. Because they don't have it in the alphabet. Something similar to that. Such a scam. <laughs> so why the world is full of lies and they're all promoting this scam? Only for one reason. Hatred to Jews. That's it. Not one go in the world for a second believe that they were there before. Come on. They heard. They heard the truth. But it saves our political agenda. Why not? If we can give it to the Jews, we can stab them, why not? And by the way, it's also a part of the divine plan. Shem make the plan that the Goim will chase us to hunt us until the last second in this world. Until Mashiach would come. And then the Torah say, what will be the revenge that Hashem will take against all these nations? They don't know what's waiting for them. When it will begin, believe me, they'll, re they'll regret the moment they ever disrespected the Jews. They'll kill themselves. What did I gain? Demonstrating in London against Israel. What did I gain? Look what I'm going to suffer now for that. Only one thing. You going against my children? You read in the Torah in your church that these are the chosen people that I chose them from all the nation. I call them my children. I name the land, the land of Israel, I name it, after their father Jacob, which his name was Israel. I gave them the Torah. I name myself the God of Israel. Not the God of the Arabs, not the God of the Germans, not the God of the Russians, the God of Israel. Meaning everyone else is not important. They are the only thing I care about. Not the only, but almost the only thing I care about. And you dare to go against what I say? Wait, what wait for the, for you? Just wait and see. Some Gentiles are smart. They love Israel. I see sometimes black people from Uganda, from Africa. People send me videos. They say, I don't understand. You, somebody in South Africa was speaking to the parliament. And they booing him. All these anti-Semites in South Africa... They booed this black man that was speaking for the Jews. He said, God say everyone who loves the Jews will be blessed. And everyone who go against them will be cursed. You don't know what you're doing to yourself. You wait and see what's coming for you. And instead of listening, they're booing him. Why is it? Because, you know, Hashem wanted them to give us hard time. The hard time they give us actually keeps us together. Imagine they all love us. They all accept us. There will be not one Jew left. Jews will marry all of them. And that's it. After a few generations, Jews are assimilated all over the world and it's gone. It's over. There's no aliyah anymore. Israel has no significance. Why? There's no Jews left. There's no Jews left in the world. The Torah doesn't have any meaning. No Torah, no meaning, no purpose. The world is finished. There's no purpose for the creation anymore. The Zohar, the Kabbalah, the holy Zohar from 2,000 years ago, it says there is a bond between three entities. God, the Torah, and the nation of Israel. Kucha berichu, oraita, en Am Israel, chadem. There are three entities that are actually one. God, the Torah, and the Jews. They are one. You cannot separate one out of the triangle here. You cannot separate one. You cannot take the Torah out of the equation. You cannot take God out. You cannot take the Jews out. Everyone does not have a perfect value without the other two. If a Jew doesn't have Torah, he's worthless. He has zero value. If the Torah doesn't have Jews to follow it, also have no value. <laughs> it's a book collecting dust. If God would not give the Torah to the world, 
no one would even know he exists. No one would know anything about him. What value will have in a world without the Torah? If the Jews wouldn't have God, would they be able to survive one second among 70 wolves that try to attack their one sheep? <laughs> God is their shield, is their oxygen, is their everything. So it's like a table. You have a round table that have three legs. One, two, and three, like a shape of a triangle. If you take one out of the legs of the table, the table right away falls out. You take Hashem out of the story, not, not, nothing has value anymore. You take the Torah out, nothing has value. You take the, the Jews out, same thing. Achuta meshulash lo bimerait natek. You know why? The Zohar say, this is the divine words. Israel, Kutsha Berichu, Veoraita Chadem. Israel, God, and the Torah is one. They cannot separate it. It's one piece. You know, if a king doesn't have a nation, does he want anything? One time I get a call. Rabbi, would you agree to meet the king of uh, some nation in Africa? I never heard about that name. Some nation. I say, who? The king of such and such. Why should I meet him? He wants to meet you. Why? He listens to your lecture and he converted to Judaism. And he's now in Israel. <laughs> I started to ask around, who is this man? He said, ah, don't pay attention. He barely have 20 people. A king with 20 followers. He comes from some royal family in Africa. But throughout the generation, I guess, they disappeared, you know. <laughs> when a king has one million people in his country, very, very nice. If he has 10 million, even better. If he has 100 million, even better. Everybody understand that the more citizens follow the kingdom of this man, the more precious his kingdom is, right? <laughs> if five people come to pray to you in a synagogue, five people, what kind of a ceremony is this? Nobody showed up. But if 5,000 people showed up, it's called Berov Am Hadrat Melech. The more of the nation gather together, the more beauty and special specialty it gives to the king. That's why better to pray in a large minyan than in a small one. Why? The more people in a synagogue, the more honor God is getting. But that's only if it's a kosher synagogue. If you go to a small synagogue of 20, 30 people, and all of them, Avrechim, Bnei Torah, Talmidei Chachamim, they learn in yeshivot, respect the prayers, nobody talks, no smartphones, everyone dress properly, nice divrei Torah. Or you have a very large synagogue full of clowns, full of heretics, full of mechalelei Shabbat, all kinds of Hashem Yerachem kind of people there, talking, politics, sport, noise, nobody can hear when they read in the Torah Bechlal from the noise. Place like this, you should not pray there. Not only is not glory to Hashem, it's a spit in His face that 500 or 1,000 people gathered into a synagogue and instead of focusing on praying and listening to the reading of the, the Torah, they are busy chatting with each other like they are in a market or on a beach. Needless to say, if the women comes without modesty there and all kinds of people, Mechalelei Shabbat, some places even have a valet parking, believe it or not. Valet parking on Shabbat. You don't know sometimes if to laugh or to cry. You know, you have these moments that you don't know if now it's the time to cry or to laugh. First reaction, you want to laugh. Ma? Synagogue? They call themselves orthodox? Someone is parking the car? Ma? On Shabbat? <laughs> One was a bunch of clowns. 
then you begin to think and you realize how deep is the Jewish nation have sunk. How deep we are. We're in such a hole that the people do not even understand what a tragedy, what a horrific crime against God they're performing, thinking that they are doing something positive. You see, if you have a mass murderer, a serial killer, and any minute does he think that what he does is positive? No. He knows that he's murdering people. He's not proud of it. He has the drive to murder for whatever reasons, and he does it. Usually it's all psychos. Mental cases. Abuse. Young age. Who knows what he had, what he had to go through. Did you ever see a person who goes and shot people in the head and kill them thinking he's committing a good deed? Besides some Arab terrorists, I don't think normal people that decided to murder something, someone think that what they did is something to be proud of. If someone beating up a dog, torturing a dog, does he think that what he does is a positive thing? Usually not. He knows that what he does is wrong. Most of the crimes that people do, they understand that it's a negative thing what they are doing. To come to a synagogue with a car thinking I'm doing such a great mitzvah, I'm coming to the synagogue instead of going to the beach, I drive to the shul to listen to the prayers and to meet friends. What can be wrong with that? What can be wrong? You create fire on Shabbat when you start the car. And it's written, Lo tevaru esh b'chol moshvotechem b'yom ha-Shabbat. Where is it written? In 12 places in the Torah. We just read about it on Shabbat in Parashat Vayakel. The previous Shabbat, Parashat Kitisa, Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yumat. And in other 10 more places in the Torah. This is how blinded people can be. This is how blinded they can be. That not only that they forgot already that what they are doing is a horrible crime against God, at one point they started to be proud of what they are doing. It's great. Better that we don't come to shul? Of course better. <laughs> do, it, do it right. You want to commit a crime against God and that's what brings you to his house? Come on. So, Abotai, conclusion to everything we said, these Reformed people, even though they don't keep one thing from the Torah, one thing they never dare to do, to modify the Torah. They will marry men with men. You read to them in the Torah that it's a death penalty. But they didn't change it. It's written in the Torah, you're not allowed to marry anybody from a different nation or, or that is not your nation. The Jews are not allowed to assimilate. They read it, and they do the opposite. It's written in the Torah, you're not allowed to eat pork. They read it, and they eat pork. It's written in the Torah, a woman has to go to the mikveh, tarat mishpacha. They read it, and ignore it. It's written in the Torah, a lot of different things. They read it. They go to the synagogue, they read it, on a Zoom. I wonder what goes through the mind of a reform when he reads in the Torah that there is a death penalty to him and to his husband. Two gays. He reads about it now. What does he think about the Torah? You read something like this. One reaction should be, we should change the Torah. It's not relevant anymore. 20% of the people are gays already. Why do you want to exclude 20% of the community? In every democratic country, that's already a cancer in society. It spreads everywhere. Let's change the Torah and allow it. That's what the reform should have done. Let's fix it. So they have one next week, they fix Shabbat. Lo tevarush b'chol moshon Shabbat. Instead of law, they erase the law. They erase the law. You should kill. They erase the law. Steal. Whatever they want, they modify. 
Then today we will have hundreds of different Torahs. It will create a huge confusion. This is something Hashem made sure will never happen. To me, personally, my guess would be that Hashem mamash interfered with their free will and prevented them from making a different version of Torah. Even though it was it needless to say that that's something that they should have done, these corrupted, wicked people. It's the first thing that they should have done. Why? That nobody would question their behavior. No one would question them. Why are you doing this? In my Torah, it's written that it's allowed. What do you mean? In all the other Torah, it's written that it's a death penalty. Not in mine. How do you know yours is the right one? Mine is the right one. The Muslims don't know which Quran is the original. The Christian does not know. We also don't know after a few generations. It will be the end of us. The end of us. That's why Hashem made sure, two things Hashem made sure. One is that no one will ever deliberately will actually modify the Torah in writing. No one. And one more thing Hashem made sure that when 80,000 times people invented a fake religion, it was always one person. It would never be more than one. Mary came, I had a dream. One woman. Muhammad came, I met Angel Gabriel in a desert. One person. Buddha came, I saw the light. One person. Anyone who ever came to claim something, Hashem made sure it will be one individual. Not a group of people. Because if it would be a hundred people, then you would have a very serious problem. The Torah says, Two and up. Two kosher witnesses who come and testify about something that happened, you have to accept their testimony. Of course, you investigate them in separate rooms. You make an FBI investigation to make sure that it's not a conspiracy. But after they passed all these questions... That's it. You must accept the testimony. You execute people based on two witnesses. You execute people. Two people came in the old days when there was Sanhedrin, testified that this guy broke Shabbat. They investigate them for days. All questions they answer accurate. Where was it? What time? Under the tree? What was the side of the fruit? What is it, how is it relevant to the Chilun Shabbat? Someone went to the orchard under the orange tree and lit a cigarette on Shabbat. He didn't know two witnesses are watching. They came to the Sanhedrin, testified. Now they check the, the witnesses in two different rooms. Hey, Moshe, tell me, what time was uh, when he lit the cigarette? 2.02 02 p.m. He asked the other guy the same thing. Uh, what was he wearing? Blue jacket, red tie, this, that, everything perfect matching. Perfect. So they ask him, after they, they tried all the, after they tried all the questions and everything was a match, then after that, they ask him, what was the size of the fruits on the tree? You, you say that it was under the tree, right? So what was the size of the fruit? What, how is it relevant to the actual crime? I told you the location. I told you the tree, the tree. I told you where. I told you what time. I told you what was he wearing. I told you basically everything you need to get a conviction. How is it relevant if the, if the tree had big oranges or small? How is it relevant? No, what do you think? The answer is absolutely not relevant. Not relevant. So why you disqualify the testimony based on something that is not relevant? Because the answer was, we do not want to execute anyone, even though we know they're guilty. We want to leave it to God. Why should we spill his blood? Why should we be the one who kill him? Why? Anyway, nobody runs away from God in the end. Everybody gets what he deserves, sooner or later. Why should we run to execute people? So if there is a contradiction, we play dumb. Contradiction, you cannot convict. 
But let's say there was no contradiction. No contradiction whatsoever. Now they have to execute the person. Based on the testimony of two individuals, you kill a person. Based on the testimony of two witnesses in a chupa, they must be Shomer Shabbos. If, not, if they're not Shomer Shabbat, the marriage never took place. Or at least one of them is not Shomer Shabbat. Based on a kosher, two kosher witnesses that see the men put the ring on the fingers of a woman, and they sign on a ketubah, this woman is forbidden to the whole world. Based on the testimony of two people that heard that one person dedicated his cow as a donation to the temple, nobody can ever enjoy from that cow. No one. That's it. This cow is holy. It, is, it belongs to Bet HaMikdash. It belongs to, to the Kohanim in Bet HaMikdash. Nobody is allowed to use it to plow the ground or to get milk from it. Or if it's a sheep, you're not allowed to enjoy the wool. Why? It belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Ordinary people are not allowed to benefit from it. It has to go to the temple. So the, the power of speech is beyond words. But you know what? Even greater than that. Even without witnesses. A person say, this chair is forbidden to me to use. You have a chair. I forbid the chair on me. Kunam alai. It's making a nether. He can never sit on that chair. If he sits on the chair, it's worse than eating pork. Why? The chair is kosher. <laughs> Big rabbi sits on it every day in the shul. Once he made a nether, he won't, this chair is forbidden to me. He can never touch it, can never enjoy from it. There is a, a, there is a case. There were two partners in a the business. They had a big fight. Big fight. And they broke, broke up the partnership. And one of them made a vow that he will never look at the face of his partner ever again. No matter where he's going to be, I will not go, go there. I'm not going to be in the same place with him. I don't want to look at his lousy face. Made a vow. A few months later, his partner, the crook, died. Got a heart attack and died. Now he started to feel guilty the partner that made the vow. So he wants to pay respect. You know, they put the body in a synagogue, people come to say goodbye. He wants to now come, in the old days they used to put the body open. And then they take it to the cemetery. So he wants to come and ask Mechila forgiveness. Everybody comes to ask from the deceased person forgiveness before they bury him. So he wants to come now, but he made a vow, he will never see his face. So he came to the rabbi. Rabbi, I don't know what to do. It's a catch-22. If I go, I break my vow. If I don't go, who knows how much he's angry at me for breaking the partnership and making the vow. He's going to go now to his trial in front of God. Who knows what is he going to say about me. I'm very nervous. I would like to come to apologize before they bury him. But I made a vow. I won't see him ever again. The rabbi told him, no problem, you can go. Why? When a person makes a vow that he will not see the face of a human being, that means only when he's alive. Once he died, looking at his face is not considered looking at his face. Why? Because the soul is not in the body. It's a piece of meat. What's the difference? Same nose, same eyes, same hair, same cheeks. Same beard, same everything. He's laying here. Yes, he cannot talk, he cannot move, but it's the same face. I swore I will not look at his face ever again. The answer is, you're allowed. Why you're allowed? We learn it from the Torah. Remember, everything we learn from the book of God. We don't make up our own rules. It's written that Hashem said to the Jews, I'm taking you out of Egypt now, and you will never ever see the face of these Egyptians ever again. You're getting rid of them for good. The, na the nation of Israel came to the Red Sea. The water opened up. They went through. The Egyptians went, followed them. God closed the water on their heads 
and they all drown. And then the, wa the water spit them out. And they all came to the shore, 600 chariots with 600 soldiers. Egyptians are all laying there dead. That's when they got all the jewelry from the horses, from the chariots. From the, they were full of rubies and good. The, the amount of wealth that they took from these 600 chariots, Bizat Ayam, was even greater than the, the, what they took from Egypt itself. That's how wealthy these Egyptians were, thanks to Yosef. He made them the most, most the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. The whole world sold their real estate and property to buy food from them. They are the only one who had food. Hashem made complete hunger in the world, starvation. So everything was belonged to them. That's it. An unlimited amount of money, like the, uh, the Saudi sheikhs multiplied by a million. That's so much that they put on the horses all kinds of chains. Each ruby today could be $2 million. You go to 47th Street, ask Mr. Mikhailov, Mr. Gavrielov, Mr. Borokhov, how much is a two-carat ruby would cost me? Find out. So imagine millions of dollars on every horse, multiplied by 600. But the Torah said that God said to the Jews, you will never ever see their face again. But here you go. They're all dead now, and we collect the jewelry, and we have to see their face. Ma, God doesn't know what he's talking about? Obviously, the answer, if they are dead, it's not considered seeing their face. So the rabbi gave him this proof from the Torah. When someone died, in his life, you couldn't look at his face because he made a vow. Once he's dead, the vow doesn't apply. That reminds me that one time, there was a, a king, and his wife, she wasn't so modest. So she used to go to the river, you know, the, the water are running by the river, floating water. They're running, and she goes to swim when people with the horses passing by the river. And it wasn't something that women did, you know, it's not modest. Even the, the, the goyot, the non-Jews, especially the queen. So people with the horses look at the queen swimming. Yeah, she has a gown. No, no, nobody ever heard about bathing suit back then. But, you know, she's still in the water, it gets wet. And it's not modest. So people started to talk. So the king heard that all kinds of men are wondering how this stupid king allow his wife to wash in a river. How they allow such thing. So the king told his wife, he told his wife, I forbid you, I forbid you I forbid you from swimming in this river. If you ever go into this water one more time, I will throw you out, divorce you, and you're gone. You're no longer the queen. After a month, she couldn't resist. She went again. And while she was swimming there, people came to the king to tell him what she did. And the king said, that's it! Pack your stuff and go back to your mother. You cannot enter the palace anymore. I made a vow. You know how it is. After a week, he started to miss her. He's lonely, laying there in the bed, watching the, the fancy chandelier and all the beautiful fancy schmancy palace. But he doesn't have the woman he loves. He, he call all his advisors. What do you suggest? Say, your majesty... You cannot, you cannot make yourself look like a fool. No one will take you seriously in this country after that. You have to stick to your vow. After all of that, one guy came to him and said, King, these uh, advisors, these goyim, they're too strict. They didn't like her to begin with. That's why they're all against her. Why don't you call a rabbi? These rabbis have all kinds of tricks. They find all kinds of leniency. Call the rabbi and ask him if this vow is, is actually valid. After all, we learn about vows from the Torah of the Jews, no? The king called the rabbi, 
The rabbi asked, what's the story? He told him she was going to that river. So the rabbi said, there's no problem. There's no problem. You can actually bring her back. The king said, just like that? The vow has no meaning? The rabbi said, no, the vow has a huge meaning. You're not allowed to break a vow. So how are you letting me bring her back? He said, because the vow you made, nev- she never broke it. What do you mean? You told her, I ask you specifically what words you told her. You told her, next time you go into this water, you are gone. I'm divorcing you, right? You say, right. He said, but the, after a month when she went, it wasn't that water. It was water that came from Africa. The water are keep coming. The water where she went last time is already all the way in Libya. <laughs> It's not the same water. The rabbi, he kissed him. Here, take a big chunk of gold. I want you to come, bring your books, sit by my palace. Whenever I need advice, I'll come to you. After a while, the woman got him angry again. The king likes to drink. He gets angry, like the guy over there outside screaming. So... (laughs) So, you know, the woman got on his nerve, the queen, and he was eating pomegranate. So he said to her, I'm warning you, stop what you're doing. She ignores him. He warned her again. He said, listen, when I finish eating my pomegranate, if you continue to do what you do, you are divorced. You pack your stuff and you leave. He finished the pomegranate, and she's still doing it. Ah, metzafzefet alai. Put an X on me. I don't count. Arrest her. Take her out of here. I don't want to look at her. You know, the story repeats after a week. He's lonely. Rabbi, where have you been? Ah, it was a Jewish holiday. Oh, Baruch Hashem, you came back. For one week, I'm lonely here. Do something. What's the story? I was eating my pomegranate. She was getting on my nerve. I warned her. I made a vow. If you, by the time I finish the pomegranate, if you do not stop, you finish. You divorce. She continued. I had to divorce her. There were witnesses here. The rabbi said, relax. What do you have me for? All of a sudden, the rabbi goes under the table. Persian rug, antique Persian rug. The rabbi goes like this. Oh, I found two pieces of pomegranate. You see, you never finished the pomegranate yet. <laughs> you said the minute you finish the pomegranate, she'll be divorced. Baruch Hashem, you never finished it. You see? If now you swallow those two, that's a problem. No, 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 put this in the garbage. You can call her back. See, you need wisdom. But after all these beautiful stories, if a person say, this is forbidden on me, that's it. can never enjoy from it. And if he swears something, then he will not do certain things, it's finished. And if he say, I contribute this amount of tzedakah to this kosher cause, he must give it. Even in, when it comes to tzedakah, even if he only thought about it in his mind, he's already obligated. Not just a thought. A final thought. He didn't have to say it loud. He was sitting with himself in his house, thinking, I want to give this rabbi such and such amount to do what he does. That's it. What was the amount? I don't know, $5,000. And he said, okay, tomorrow... When I go, I give him the money. By tomorrow, the Yitzhara already attacked him. This, the stock is down, the market is down. His wife just spent a huge amount on the American Express. So he has to cut in a budget. So where is he going to cut? From the 5,000 he has to give to the rabbi. 2,000, it's enough for him. Not allowed. Once he was sagur in his mind, if he was just debating, how much should I give? 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, ah, I'm not sure. Thinking. Did not make a final decision in his mind. That's no, no nether yet. But once he finished all his debate with, his, with himself and he decided that 
in this particular moment, today, tomorrow, next week, when I see him, I'm giving him this amount, he must give it. He cannot change the amount. You want to give to poor, you want to give to Bachur Yeshiva, you want to give for Kiruv. Once you closed in your mind to give, you must give. The only time you can get out of that vow is if you find that the vow was made based on false information. You thought that that's a holy man that does holy things, and a minute before you came to give the money, someone just warned you that the money goes to buy Swiss watches for $100,000 a piece, or to buy Mercedes, or to buy, I don't know what, private jet. That's not what I had in mind. I wanted to help Yeshiva. I wanted to help Kiruv. I wanted to help uh, the synagogue. I wanted to help the Mikveh. That was a, that's what I had in mind. Ah, now when I found out that it's not exactly the way they presented it, now you just found a way out. But it's not a way out completely. You must give the money, but not to him. To a similar cause or higher. So I'll give you an example. If you wanted to give it to Yeshiva A, we're not saying names, so there's no Lashon Arayir, Yeshiva A, and you went to check the yeshiva out before you give a big amount of money to that yeshiva, and you found out they are not 100% in a standard of whole yeshivot. Things are not perfect there, let's say. That's an understatement. So you say, no, no, I'm not giving them a penny. I see who's teaching here all kinds of heretics, all kinds of modern, corrupted people. I don't want to give them a penny. The money is not going to Kedusha, it's going to the Sitra Acha over here. They let all kinds of people from the black list to teach here, to speak here, to write here. They admire all kinds of heretics. This yeshiva is not for me. I don't want to give them a penny. But it's true. You found out that they're not kosher, you don't have to give them. But what about the amount that you pledged? Even in your mind. Needless to say in your mouth. Needless to say in public. If it was an auction or something. This you must give. You must give it to a different yeshiva. You have to find a kosher yeshiva, and the same amount you wanted to give them, you must give them, because the vow does not get cancelled. What you say to give to yeshiva, you must give. But you can switch from non-kosher to a kosher one. Same thing, synagogue. You wanted to give money to a specific synagogue. They're building the synagogue. And you say, okay, once there's going to be a grand opening, I'm going to give you a check for such and such amount. You told the Gabay there. Then you came to the grand opening, you saw there's no separation between the men and the women. It's not kosher. It's not a kosher place. You're not allowed to give them a penny. You're not allowed. Not, you're not obligated. A place that is not kosher according to the halakha, you're not allowed to give them a penny. So now, since you are not allowed to give the money to the synagogue that you thought it's going to be kosher, but now you just found out they are not kosher, so you must give it to a different synagogue that it's kosher. But you don't have to give to a synagogue. You can give to yeshiva instead. Because yeshiva is a lot higher than a synagogue. Synagogue is a silver coin. Yeshiva is a diamond. If somebody gave you a thousand dollars to buy him a silver coin, and instead you bought him a diamond, will he complain? No. He will kiss you on the head. Wow, what an upgrade. I thought you were bringing me a silver coin. No, look what I got you. I got you a diamond for the same amount of money. That's a great upgrade. No one will complain. But if I gave you to give me a diamond, and instead you're giving me a silver coin, of course I will complain. That's deceiving. So there is a rule, it's called Ma'alim Bakodesh. You're allowed to do an upgrade to the cause, but not a downgrade. So for instance, if you wanted to give to one poor person X amount of money, and then you found out he's not eating kosher food, he's not making brachot, he's not Shomer Shabbat, you're not allowed to give him money. Not allowed. What is he going to do with your money? Mechalel Shabbat with that. You don't want that. 
So now you have to find a kosher poor man. Kosher poor man. Poor man? Poor man! No problem. You did not downgrade the cause. But you can also give it to an avrech that learns Torah full day. Maybe he's not as poor as this first one, but he's a kosher person. You give him the money, he learns Torah with that. That's an upgrade. And Kiruv is above everything. No matter what you pledge to here, to this, to that, if in the end you found something that is not kosher, you give it to save souls, there's nothing greater in the eyes of Hashem than saving souls. It's written clearly in the Zohar, Parashat Truma, in Chovot HaLevavot, and in hundreds of other sources. So if you switch to good yeshiva, you're always good. No matter what was the original cause, if in the end you found that it's not kosher and you gave to good kosher yeshiva, you're good. Because yeshiva is in the highest level. If you switch to kiruv, you're good. Less than that, you have to check. If you pledge to yeshiva, you cannot give it to a synagogue. Unless the synagogue has a kolel there that learns full day. Oh, it's a different story. So I give to the kolel. You got the point or no? Today, someone asked me a very interesting question. Actually, the question started last night at 2 a.m. And it continued today after uh, Shachrit. He said, Rabbi, I work in real estate. Two partners started to do business with me. I buy from them, they buy from me, I flip to them, they flip to me. You know, real estate. Now, one of them came, I want to flip a property that I bought. I don't want to build it and fix it. I want to quickly make a little profit and let someone else renovate. So I approach one of the two partners. He said, okay, I'll do the deal. But don't tell my partner. Meaning, I'll do it with you. I don't want him to know about it. Now, this person who asked me this question is a person that is my Baal Tshuva from uh, 20-something years ago. Very good, decent person. Mamash, great guy. Mamash, honest, humble, great heart, great midot. Baruch Hashem. So he now feels uncomfortable. In one hand, he wants to make, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars in one minute, flip the house to someone, fill up the paper, makes nice profit. But now, he, since he's a God-fearing Jew, he's, uh, he's wondering if he's even allowed to do such thing. Let's look at the question now. Option number one, you may say, it's not my problem, two partners cheat each other, what does it have to do with me? Did I tell you to be a partner with him? Whatever happened between you and him, it's your problem. I want to sell a property. Do I care who comes and buy it? Someone doesn't tell his wife that he buy the property. Is that my responsibility? Someone cheat his partner, doesn't tell him. Is that my responsibility? I sell it, and whatever they do, it's their business. That's one option. Second option... I allow to sell it, but I have to inform the partner. Why? Because the Torah say, if a Jew is bleeding, meaning either physically or financially, meaning he's losing something, he has a leak. He has a leak in his backyard and the neighbor sees it, he's not allowed to ignore it. He has to tell him right away, you're losing water, water costs money. Or a neighbor flew to Israel for a month and they forgot the lights on in the house or the air condition. Here the engine works outside, the motor. So he calls him to Israel. Hey, Moshe, how are you? What was? Everything okay? Hey, everything okay. You just left the air condition on. By the time you come back, you have a $1,000 electric bill. What should I do? Oh, I hide the key over here or you have a code. Go from the basement. Thank you very much. And I'll have to ignore it. If you ignore, you will be punished for causing him that damage. So, the, so here you may say, okay, I have something to sell. Someone came to sell. He wants to cheat his, his client, his uh, partner. That partner is a Jew. I have an obligation to warn him because he's about to lose money. So first I sell it to Ruven. 
And then I will call to Shimon quietly and tell him, I just want you to know that your partner is cheating you in a business. Why? The other day I sold him a property. The fourth option is, you're not allowed to sell him the property. Why? Because once you sell him the property, you're helping him to deceive his partner. You become a part of the crime. You participate in a crime. Because if you would refuse to sell it to him, there won't be any crime. So what kind of a sin is that? Aleph, Messiah, Lide, Ovre, Avera. Bet, Lifnei, Iver, Lot, Iten, Michshol. Do not put a trap in front of a blind man. His evil inclination is boiling now. He wants to cheat his, car, his partner for money. And you are actually put a, a, a trap in front of him by allowing him and helping him to keep that secret. And also, you're violating another halacha of lo ta'amod al dam recha. Another Jew, a brother of yours, is about to lose money. And you did not warn him from that. Which one of the four is accurate? If you are the Dayan in a bed din, and somebody asks you this question, which one of the four options is allowed according to the Torah? Do you remember all four actions or no? Four uh, options? Or you cannot focus more than five seconds? Remember, there was the topic tonight. Can you focus 60 seconds on one word without interference? If not, you know your brain is rusty. Needs an overall. Fluid wash. Huh? Number three is the best option, Benji say. It, it means you're allowed to sell it. And then you have to go and warn the partner that his partner is cheating him. Anyone agree with him? Huh? Anyone think number one is the option? I sell it, whatever between you and your partner is none of my business. Next time, choose who you do partnership with. I don't have to be your father. I don't have to be your keeper. It's your problem. Ah, I'm going to push my nose into other people's business. Anyone agree with this option or no? All of you are smart. This option is out of the table. Option number two. You remember? Option number two is uh, you want to sell him the property. And, uh, you know, you sell him the property. And after you sell him the property... You go to that person and tell him, that's actually uh, number two. Your, your option was a different one. Was Number three was that you sell him the property. No, you, wait, wait a minute. We, how did we get to four? I think we had only three options here. Huh? Three options we had. Okay, option number one, you're allowed to sell it and it's none of my business. Option number two, you sell it, but you have to go warn the partner. And option number three, you're not allowed to sell it. Which one of the three is? The last one? Anyone agree with number one and two? All of you could be Dayanim, Baruch Hashem. The answer is you're not allowed to sell him. By selling him, you break few rules of the Torah. Few rules of the Torah. One of the... One of the rules is, like I say, לא תעמוד על דם רעך. Two, לפני עיוור לא תיתן מכשול. Three, מסייע לידי עוברי עבירה. Even though that's Rabbanan, אבל that's already a third sin. And four, השבת אבדה. It's a lost object of your friend. He's in your hand right now. He's stealing from his partner. So, I want to ask a question about what you say. You're, you're all right, but I want to challenge it now. Why can't we just say, okay, uh, you want to cheat your, your partner, and uh, I want to sell you the property, right? So we have now two partners, and uh, why am I obligated to warn him He's not really stealing from his partner a pocket. He's just preventing future profit 
from his partner. Is that the same or no? If you come to someone's pocket and rob him for five hundred dollars cash, isurdo raita, no question ask. What happened if you just spoke bad about his business when he was standing by the gate? And a customer was about to come in and spend five hundred dollars on a suit, and you told him, "Don't buy from this guy; he's a crook." And the customer went across the street and bought a suit over there. You prevented him from making five hundred dollars sale. Is it the same, like stealing money from his pocket, or no? Are both of them a sin from the Torah? First option, for sure, it's a sin from the Torah. You actually stole from his pocket. Okay. From his home. He sold the Oraita of Gezel. Preventing profit is also he sold the Oraita? The Oraita. A hundred percent. So what's the difference? What's the difference? The difference is one is a direct crime and one is an indirect crime. When it comes to judgment, when it comes to judgment, if Reuven stole from Shimon, Shimon knows he, owe, he stole from me five hundred dollars. If something valuable that belongs to Reuven falls to the hand of Shimon, that worth at least five hundred dollars, he doesn't have to go to bed din. He can take it, sell it take his money and give him the change. What's this? I saw the UPS delivered a nice compu- laptop to your home. I took the laptop. I checked on Google. The laptop worth $700. Here is $200. You owe me $500 that you stole from me. I took the laptop. I owe you $200 difference. Here is your $200. He cannot do anything now. You hold, now you're holding the laptop. He cannot get it out of your hand. When the gazelle or the damage is indirectly, the bedding doesn't have the power to collect by force. If something fell into your hand, yes, but to go and collect by force, like in the first case, they don't have. So Rabotai, time is running out. We learn from here a very important lesson for life. That we are really one family. A Jewish nation. We are guarantors for each other. We cannot sit and do nothing when someone else is losing. We cannot sit and do nothing when someone else is bleeding. We cannot... Sit and do nothing when a Jew is disconnected from Hashem. We cannot sit and do nothing when a donkey of a Jew collapses and he needs help to lift him by, mo- by removing weight from the back of the donkey. Chazal say, if the donkey of your enemy, the Torah say, if you see the donkey of your enemy collapse, you run and help him to bring the, man- the donkey up, the Torah says, if the enemy, the donkey, the donkey, or not your person, not your enemy, the donkey of your enemy, the donkey collapsed, you cannot pass by and not run to help. If it's the donkey of your lover, not your enemy, needless to say, if for the enemy you have to help someone you like, it's obvious that you have to help, right? If you have to love, to help someone you like bring up his donkey, don't you have a much bigger obligation to save his soul? To save the lousy donkey, you're not allowed to ignore. You must run, get dirty with your suit. Oh, it's so heavy. You became a moving worker now. With you, you pick up the bags, you remove them from the donkey, the donkey is, is not getting up, you try to pick him up. It's a whole job. The Torah says, if you continue to walk, you're a criminal. You'll be punished for that. So to save the donkey of your enemy, you must. To save the soul 
of a human being from your nation that is not even your enemy a million times needless to say do you know where it says it in the Torah? Arur asher lo yakim et divrei ha-Torah azot ve'amar kol ha'am amen. Hashem made a list of curses. He made a list of curses. The last curse in the list is a general curse. All the other curses are specific about one sin. The last one is a general curse. Arur, Arur means cursed, like the snake, cursed. Arur asher lo yakim et divrei ha-Torah azot ve'amar kol ha'am amen. What does it mean Arur asher lo yakim, yakim et divrei ha-Torah azot? He didn't say Arur asher lo yakayem et divrei ha-Torah azot. Yakayem means someone who does not observe the laws of the Torah he will be cursed. That's not what it says. Yakim means something is in a mud or something collapsed. You have to bring it, bring it back to stand. Something now fell in the mud. You got to bring it back up. Chas v'shalom, the Torah fell on the floor. You run quickly, you lift it, and you put it where it was. If you let it stay on the floor, you are cursed forever. Aru asher lo yakim. Yakim means bring up. The Mefarshim say, someone who does not do kiruv is a ruh, is cursed. That he doesn't make sure that the Torah is standing proud everywhere to all the other Jews. In Tel Aviv, in the kibbutz, in Manhattan, in Long Island, no matter where. lo yakim. How do you make the Torah stand? With proud, with pride. Either you teach Torah, if you don't know how to teach, you sponsor. Sponsor lectures, promote lectures on social media, pay. You don't have to send the donations. You can pay with your own money. You take a good lecture, let's say one hour lecture, very strong, inspiring lecture. You pay to Facebook a few thousand dollars, it will go to a million people. You can target by zip code. Same thing with YouTube, zip codes where the Jews live. I don't know, Beverly Hills, it's almost all Jews. Great Neck, half of the population are Jews. Places where you know there's a lot of Jewish population who not everyone is religious. You take from your master money and promote, promote lectures. Some clowns promote their heresy and they get millions of views. They have a lot of money. The Satan makes sure all the heretics in my blacklist, every one of them is a multi-millionaire. Why? Someone asked me, how come Santa is popular? I mean, I listened to what he said, it's terrible. I mean, I want to faint. How is it possible? I told him he has a very good promoter. He asked me, who? He said, the Satan. He works for him day and night to make sure more and more fools will publish the speeches and pay for it. Uh, you have a very, very big, giant Chachamim. I can give you a list, Rabbi Tzion Abba Shaul. Besides his direct student, the world didn't know who he is. Rav Avigdor Miller, same story. Rav uh, Shimshon Pinkus Zatzal, same story. Many legendary, holy Talmidei Chachamim, only a few hundreds or a few thousand people in the whole world knew about them. Some of them became very famous after they passed. After they passed. Rav Ovadia Yosef was different because he was always, you know, also a political figure. You know, there was always on the news and this, that he was famous everywhere. But other rabbis who were not in politics, who were not involved in all kinds of other things, no, nobody knew who they are, besides their own students. Some of them became what they are only after they died. Even the Ramchal, the Ramchal, the legendary Ramchal, they forbid him from teaching. I told him, you teach Kabbalah, you're only 18 years old, you don't have a beard. Beard, they're afraid, he doesn't have a beard, they don't, they don't want him to teach Kabbalah. Well, what kind of a Kabbalist doesn't have a beard? Very important in the Zohar, Kabbalah, the Ari, this. He didn't have a beard because his beard didn't grow. 
is uh, Italianos, the Italianos and Mexicans, some of them don't have beards. It's empty. Very thin air they have. No, no, serious, you see, they have uh, spots in the in face that are not, no air going. So they made him, they put him on a band, they sent him letters to threaten him. They gave him hell on earth, nightmare. And in 39 years of life, he wrote more than 100 books. Most of them are gone. The world did not have a merit to learn his divine wisdom. And now he's one of the most important rabbis in the history of the Jewish nation. You cannot understand Jewish philosophy today without Ramchal. We made, I made, Baruch Hashem, I had a schut to make a series of Path to the Just and the Ways of Hashem, two of his most important books. Remember Ways of Hashem, we made the series? When you learn in his books, now you understand what's going on. Without it, it's, <laughs> you are, it's like a blind person looking for direction in the a, in a dark. You understand, Rabotai? So, conclusion, just to conclude, this parasha we read on Shabbat, parasha Takel, the purpose of the gathering every seven years to make sure, there are different purposes as well, but one of the main ones was to check that no one copied the Torah with errors. Check. What do you have? Oh, I don't have this word. What, is it that, what do you have by you? I don't have this word. Everybody else has it? Yeah, fix. You skip the word. That's how they make sure that all the copies of the Torah, at least in the first generations, they will all be authentic. Now when you have hundreds of valley Torah everywhere, the rest of the generations will copy from a valid copy. If from the beginning you already have mistake, Muhammad, he had four wives, each one of them already had a different Quran. Do you understand now what kind of a religion is that? In his lifetime, four different Korans to four different women. Why? Because by them there is no death penalty if you copied with the wrong spelling or if you skip a letter. The Torah says someone who will change one letter from the Torah should be put to death. That's why we are very afraid. That's why we don't change anything. That's why in Judaism, the last thing you do is to modify something. The reform people over 200 years ago, they just changed one law in tzitzit. Tzitzit, one law they changed. They used to keep in the beginning everything. Today, they don't keep one mitzvah, not one, ever. Nothing. Why? Every generation that comes, my father changed this, my grandfather changed that, I'm changing this. What happened in the end? They marry men with men. They marry Jews with goyim, they eat pork on Yom Kippur. <laughs> they, eat, they eat in their churches on Yom Kippur. They bring piano on Yom Kippur with a microphone. I will finish with a funny story. When I came to America, I was 1989. 1989, first three months I lived by my father's friend in Neck. Then I moved to Queens. Once I moved to Queens, there was a friend of mine, we were friends from a very young age, also moved to America. We were from the same city. He's my only friend right now here, to Israeli. We used to go out together in those days. We were 16, 17. We're both in New York now, age 21, alone in New York. Holiday came now, Yom Kippur. We're looking for synagogue. Two... Israeli, non-religious guys wants to go on Yom Kippur to shul. Most secular people, they still go to shul on Yom Kippur in those days. So me and my friend say, where should we go? We don't know anything. I'm three months in America. He's not even three months. I said to him, I saw a big building with Magen David. Let's go over there. We walk inside. 
the way <laughs> the, the, the way we were so ignorant that when you walk in, you have a person sitting, riding, what's your name, on Yom Kippur. We didn't even see what's going on over there. We walk inside, we see it, it looks like a theater. Then me and my friend, I said to him, something is off here. <laughs> something is off here. He said, yeah, it looks like a church. I feel like we are in a church. I, say, I see, but it's Star David here. I said to him, but I don't understand why the men, the women, they all sit together. Well, something is off here. So I think I know what it is. We didn't know what reforms are. Remember, in Israel, nobody heard about reform. I asked someone, tell me, is this a synagogue or a church? I said, it's a synagogue. <laughs> I said, so why the men and the women, everyone see it? Why this piano on the stage? What, what's going on here? Microphone. <laughs> so the guy said, no, we are different. We are open. We are reform. Both of us heard reform. <laughs> we got up. <laughs> we ran out of there. As dumb as we were, as ignorant as we were, we felt the impurity, the tumah of this place after five minutes. We were suff- our neshamot who were not holy at all. And that's an understatement. We're actually suffering there five minutes sitting there with this kind of people. Think about it. <laughs> we started to understand something that is not right. Unfortunately, today is a million times worse. Today they already marry men with men, and Hashem irachem what they do. I don't think 25 years ago they used to do it. But it is what it is. So remember next time when you read Parashat, you know, Mitzvah Hakel. What is it, the Hakel, the gathering? One of the main reasons to make sure the Torah will never ever be changed. And Baruch Hashem today after... 3,300 years, 3,335 years. The Torah is the same Torah all over the world. And that's because of that punishment that Hashem put. If you dare to change my Torah, to add or to decrease something from the Torah, a mitzvah, a word, a letter, or anything, you are subject to that penalty. And Baruch Hashem, as you know, serious punishments are always the solution, almost always the solution to the problem. Yesterday I got by mail, Motsi Shabbos, $52.10 ticket from Easy Pass, New Jersey Turnpike. The toll, $2.10, the penalty, $50. Fifty dollars. Why they are doing such thing? To urge you right away to call, to make you nervous. If there was no penalty, ah, two dollars, who cares? Who has time now to waste twenty minutes with the customer service to resolve a two dollar toll? Ah, fifty dollar penalty. Now sometimes you drive on a New Jersey Turnpike, you have few tolls. Each one is fifty dollars penalty. Six dollar tolls. Uh, <laughs> $6 tolls, $150 penalty. You get nervous. When you call, they're very nice. No problem, sir. What happened? The easy pass didn't work. Sometimes it doesn't read. I remove the penalty, like they don't do your favor. I will remove the penalty, no problem. Can we charge your easy pass? Yeah, charge the easy pass. Between me and you, without the $150 penalty, 90% of the people wouldn't have the time now to call and wait on hold. What got people to resolve the payment right away? In the old days in Manhattan, I don't know if today they still do it, when I lived in Manhattan, if you park the car in a place that you're not allowed, in one hour maximum your car is towed. This is almost 30 years ago. Almost 30 years ago. Do you know how much was the towing charge? $190 besides the ticket. And they make damage to your car. You come, boom, accident, the bumper. 
They don't care. They throw the car, they put it in the west side highway in some garage. And if you don't come the same day to remove it, every day a hundred and something dollar storage fee. One week you didn't know where the car is. You didn't know. I mean, you thought maybe there's someone stole it. You call the police. The police say we don't have, uh, we don't have, we didn't find this car. We don't, you don't know. You don't know if they tow the car. Someone say to me, call the, the motor vehicle. They probably tow it. I don't know. The storage. Whatever. <laughs> Until you find where your car is, it could be a few days. By now you owe a thousand dollars. Why people run to release the car right away? Because every day it's very painful. There is a tenant in Israel. He called me up to cry. Help me out. I said, why? I'm supposed to move out of my house. I said, yeah, a long time ago they asked you to move. Why are you not moving? I don't have where to go. So what, what changed? You ask me ten times for help. I try. And you see it doesn't work. Find a place. He says, I said, but why are you extra nervous today? It sounds like something new. He said, yeah. Now I got a letter that for every day I don't move out, I have to pay $200. <laughs> ah. He's like a lion in a cage. But believe me, I really don't have where to go. <laughs> I said, you should have thought about it a long time ago. I've been telling you a long time ago. Just move, just move. Now, what doesn't come through the head, comes through the legs. Ma shelo ba derech harosh, ba derech haraglayim. That's an Israeli sentence. You can add it to the Pirkei Avot if you like. What doesn't come through the head, meaning when people talk to you, ask from you, explain to you, beg you, you think you own the world, right? You're going to learn the hard way. Learn the hard way. Once you learn the hard way, next time no one will have to beg you. You agree or no? So why everyone complain about the punishments in the Torah? If they know it's productive. The answer is, because as great as we are, as religious as we are, we're still not in a level that Hashem comes before our desire and our convenience. Do you know when you're really going to be righteous? When you will have a rule, a principle in your life. No matter how much I desire it, no matter how much I want it, no matter how much I benefit from it, First, I only check what Hashem wants. I, if it comply with what I want, I got lucky. Hashem allow it. Allah allows it, I'll do it. If it's against the Allah, I can't do it. I'm dying to do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry. I, I cry. Suffer. I can't do it. This guy, when I told him he's not allowed to sell, to flip the property, you know, the real estate market is frozen completely. Nobody makes money already for two years since they raised their interest rate. Finally, he has an opportunity to make twenty, thirty thousand dollars in one hour. And I say to him, no, not allowed. You're cooperating with a crook against his partner. It's against the Torah. No question asked. He didn't try to convince me, but this, but that. Understood, Rabbi. That's it. That's how I become a kosher Jew. First Hashem, then my pocket. First Hashem, then my desire. First Hashem, then my taste. First Hashem, then my bank account. First Hashem, then my children. First Hashem, then my desire to take revenge against people. Someone asked me today a question, He's in the business of uh, locksmith, garage doors. He said to me, listen, I'm here for years. I do business. I publish uh, advertising in Google, and I get calls from people. Few Israelis came. They got into the business. They are secular. They are wicked. They don't care. They have no God, no nothing. They start to put negative comments on my page to destroy my business that I should take over because they are my competition. Now, the business went down 
business went down 50%. If it continue like this in a few months, I'm going to have to shut down the, the business after a few good years. Am I allowed to do the same thing to them? To start publishing fake complaints on the page, terrible service, this guy is not honest, he charged me three times more than what he said. You know, lies like this. People read the comments, they get nervous. Allowed or not allowed? Ma, what do you say? Maybe it's ishtadlut. You do this to me, I'll do the same to you. Allowed or no? Not allowed. First, you're not allowed to take revenge against people. Second, just because someone did something against the Torah and ruin your reputation does not give you permission to go and ruin his reputation with lies. It's very difficult because in a secular world, it's almost a mitzvah to do it. He started. So I did the same to him, teach him a lesson. It's very ethical. It's, it's moral. He did it to me. Here, I can prove to you. He started. So I gave him what he deserved. Oh, shkoyach. Amazing. Chazaku baruch. That's heresy. That's heresy. Meaning there's no God, there's no judge. There's no justice in his world. I have to be the God. I have to be the punisher. I have to retaliate. I have to take care of my business. So I told the guy, I want to remind you, it's a bad tshuva of mine, this guy. I want to remind you that your parnasa never ever came through your business. It's all achizat enayim. It's all a fake cover-up. The parnasa come from what Hashem writes on Rosh Hashanah. That's it. This is how much you're going to make net this year. You will have business. You will not have business. You will advertise. You will not advertise. You run to work 10 hours a day or 5 hours a day. It's all not relevant. In the, in the beginning of the year, Hashem wrote how much he wants you to make. That's it. Everything else is just cover up. If Hashem decided that your business will go down 50%, he sent you that Israeli crook to start make up lies about your business. This is the way of Hashem, of bringing your business down. Now you may say, okay, so that Israeli, the crook, that make up lies, it's not his fault. He's doing God's will. If that's the case, then it's not Paro's fault, and it's not Hitler's fault. They all did what Hashem decided to do. That's not how it works. The fact that they use you to do something negative in the world, it's a sign that you're wicked. And you choose to do bad, and when you choose to do bad, Hashem transfer you to the authority of the Satan, and the Satan is using you to execute Hashem's punishment against people. If you were righteous, the Satan could not send you on a mission to hurt people. You would be a savior a good teacher, a sponsor, a philanthropist, a preacher, all kinds of help. The good people, they always run to help. The reshaim are always used to do bad in the world. Where does it say it in the Gemara? Who knows? No, you should know it by heart by now. Megalgelim, schut, al yede zakai, u megalgelim chova, al yede chayav. Good deeds are done by people that have good merit. Once you're already in the positive sides of Hashem, let's use you to do something great in the world. If you chayav, meaning you're guilty, you are in a negative side, meaning the Satan control you, megalgelim chova al yede chayav, the Satan is using you to do negative things in the world, to run Torah classes, to promote lectures of Santa Claus and all the other heretics. Because you are wicked, they use you to promote heresy in the world. If you were righteous, you would promote good lectures in the world. You would promote Rav Victor Miller, you promote Rav Bravda, you promote 
other of Shimshon Pinkus and other big tzaddikim. Once, you, based on who you promote and who is your hero, we can see who you are. If you promote idol worshipping speakers who worship a dead rabbi, then you are nothing greater than them. The fact that you open up your place and you allow such an event to be there or in your house, that means the Satan evaluates your help greatly. And he uses you on his missions. But if you are not wicked, God forbid that God would allow someone like you to become Ahti Arabim. It's written clearly, Amzaket Arabim, En Chet Baal Yado. Someone that benefits the public is dismissed and is shielded from committing sins. He has a special shield, special protection. Amzaket Arabim, Gemara Mefureshet. En chet baal yado. What does it mean en chet baal yado? Someone that teach Torah never commits sins? Beloni. Sure he does. All people commit sins almost. Almost all people. Even speakers. Even teachers. Even rabbis. No one is an angel. People have desires. Sometimes a moment of anger. Even to get angry it's a sin. To get angry. Not to wake up on time it's a sin. To eat something and maybe not have in mind the right bracha, it could be a sin. To look at a not modest woman, it's a sin. I can count a lot of sins that some people, as great as they are, sometimes commit. So what does it mean, am zaket arabim en chet baal yado? En chet baal yado laolam. That sins will not come to others because of him, because he is busy saving the public from sins. It's a contradiction. Someone will give his life to help people, to teach them the, the divine Torah, to make them shomrei mitzvot, when he's by mistake is about to publish something bad or something that will cause damage and make people commit a sin, from Shamayim Hashem ruins the plan. He has a special protection. Why? Because you are busy building. I will not make you fail crushing or ruining. Those who always ruin, I will push them to ruin more. But those that build, accidentally they're about to ruin, I will interfere and not let it happen. Oh, the computer didn't help, didn't work. Oh, there's no internet. He wanted to send something. It was Chazot Shalom Lashon I don't know what. Something went wrong. What happened? I don't get it. Why it's not working? I'm saving you, you fool you still did not understand what you're about to do. And that's what life is all about. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanan Yavin HaKashia Omer, Ratzah HaKadosh Baruch Hu Le'ezakot Et Yisrael, Lefichach, Yerba Lahem Torah Umitzvot, Shonemar Adonai